Kathy Lesser Mansfield is a senior instructor in law at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. She is executive director of the Master's Programs of Arts in Financial Integrity Program, Financial Integrity Institute at Case Western. She teaches a variety of consumer and commercial law courses and served as a policy analyst for two years with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, and as a visiting professor at Georgetown Law University. Professor Mansfield was previously professor of law and director of compliance programs at the Drake University Law School, where she also taught a course called Holocaust and the Law. She was a Silverman Fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and for a program entitled The Impact and Legacy of the Holocaust on the Law. Professor Mansfield is also a composer and librettist of an opera entitled The Sparks Fly Upward that follows three German families in Berlin, two Jewish and one Christian through the Holocaust beginning in the autumn of 1938. The story is told completely through music and is based on years of research in many Holocaust archives. She is also the founder and executive director of the Sparks Fly Upward Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating people about the Holocaust, genocide, and tolerance through presentations of sparks and ancillary activities. Kathy, we are so excited to learn with you tonight. Thank you so much. Um, it's so great to be here. I'm going to set my screen up to share and then I'll start talking. So give me just a second. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me just say uh, thank you so much for coming. I was really looking forward to being in Chicago for this and I'm very disappointed we all have to do this from home. Um, I hope that the technology will work because I have a lot of film clips and things like that that hopefully will work in this format. Um, and I think it's a good thing you're not looking at me because my light seems to be shifting constantly and so I'm going in and out of shadows and stuff. So, um, uh, okay, so um, let's get started. Um, except my computer, oh, there we go. Sorry, hang on one second. Huh. All right, already having technical difficulties. Give me just a moment. Don't let me go back. Hold on one second. Okay, apologies. Oh, goodness. All right, apparently only my mouse is going to let me forward. Live and learn. Okay, so um, I'm going to spend just a very brief amount of time talking about the history of Germany uh, just before the end of World War I. And um, this presentation, honestly, is longer than I have time for today. So I'm going to speed through a few things because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, so basically, uh, this is the history from 1871 till the end of World War I. There were three Kaisers. The last Kaiser under whom World War I was pursued uh, by Germany was Kaiser Wilhelm II. He abdicated two days before the armistice was signed and he was exiled to um, the Netherlands. Um, the thing about World War I that some of you I'm sure know is that um, it was fought primarily off of German soil and so that and of course there was no thing like zoom in the day and so there was no way for people to really know how the um, how the war was going and so they Germans generally thought the war was going fairly well um, and they were shocked when the war came to a sudden end and this led to the what's called the stabbed in the back myth which was that Germany really um, wouldn't have lost the war if it hadn't been stabbed in the back on the home front by socialist liberals, Marxists, and Jews. Um, 
when World War I ended, uh, as I said, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated, and so that left Germany really without a government. And the majority party at the time, which was the Social Democratic Party, announced that they were going to establish a republic, that Frederick Ebert was going to be the first chancellor, um, and that it was going to be a provisional government until they could get a constitution going. Um, politics at the time were extremely polarized. I'm going to show you a, a clip of a documentary in a minute that has historical footage of this, but basically communists on the left and nationalists and, and um, eventually Nazis on the right. And um, the middle was kind of left with not much in it. Um, in January of 1919, the Germans voted a national assembly. Their job was to draft a constitution, but at the same time this was going on, you had all these rebellions on both the left and the right. And indeed, it, it happened later that many people felt that the Weimar Republic was not a legitimate government because um, it had sort of been, it, it, it had been made out of whole cloth that didn't really come from any authority. Um, okay, so this is a four minute video dang it, a four minute video um, about that time period, if I can get it to run. Linda, you're not uh, touching anything, right? Correct. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening here, but. After the war, the Allies continued to blockade Germany and the returning troops who marched through Munich area. Sorry, one more second. After the war, the Allies continued to blockade Germany and the returning troops who marched through Munich, the capital of Bavaria. So um, that's from a documentary for those of you that are interested called The Nazis, A Warning from History. It's a six CD set. Um, and I assign parts of it for my Holocaust in the law class. I think it's a really excellent um, excellent um, documentary. Um, okay, so in 1919, that's when uh, the Versailles Treaty was signed, and then in August of that year, the Weimar Constitution was signed into law. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is just go through some provisions in, uh, that were in the Weimar Constitution. Uh, for those of you that are lawyers and for the, anyone who really ha knows our system, you'll see a lot of similarities between the way that constitution was structured and the way ours was. Um, the first thing that the constitution does is it establishes a presidency. The president was elected by popular election for seven years, um, eligible for re-election and recall by um, the two-third majority of the Reichstag. Um, the first president's name was Friedrich Ebert. Um, they, it also established a position of chancellor, um, and that is the position that Hitler took initially in the government. Um, the chancellor was to be appointed by the president and is the person who presided over the government of the Reich and conducted its affairs and determined the political program of the country. Um, it also established a cabinet of sorts of Reich ministers, which um, were recommended by the chancellor, appointed and dismissed by the president. Um, there were two legislative bodies, one called the Reichstag, one called the Reichsrat. Um, the Reichstag was elected by universal equal direct and secret suffrage by men and women over 20 years of age, beating us to universal suffrage. Um, the seats were allotted after the election to political parties based on the percentage of votes they received. There was a four-year term and they could pass laws by a simple majority. The, um, the other chamber, the Reichsrat, was elected by the 18 German states. Um, and then one rep from each state, um, but if for large states there was a, a larger representation. Um, the procedure for adopting legislation was that the cabinet, um, with the concurrence of either the Reichsrat or members of the Reichstag, could introduce legislation. The Reichstag got the first uh, stab at adopting it. That's the, the popularly elected body. Um, once the legislation was adopted, it could be protested by the Reichsrat, in which case the law gets returned to the Reichstag. It could be overridden by two-thirds. The president could then call for a popular referendum on a law that was passed. 
Um, so the basic point is that there was this tremendous um, balance of power between the president, the chancellor, and the two houses of parliament. Um, and you can see those checks and balances reflected in the procedure for, for adopting legislation. Um, the Constitution had this really uh, interesting provision that ended up pretty much sounding the death knell for the Weimar Constitution and the Weimar Republic later uh, when Hitler took over. Um, so first of all, there was a provision that becomes important later that said that the Constitution itself could only be amended if two thirds of the members were present and two thirds of those present consented. Um, then there was this provision, Article 48. And Article 48, before I read it, you don't need to read it while I'm talking, I'll read it in a second, but it, it basically allowed the country to declare an emergency and get rid of all civil liberties. Um, so the provision said, and this is a translation of the provision, um, the second paragraph, in the event that the public order and security are seriously disturbed or endangered, the president may take the measures necessary for the restoration, intervening if necessary, with the aid of the armed for forces, for this purpose, he may temporarily abrogate wholly or in part the fundamental principles laid down in the following articles. And as you can see, they're similar to our Bill of Rights, personal liberty, your house is your sanctuary, your communication is private, you have the freedom of expression with no censorship, the right to assembly, the right to non-criminal association, and the right to private property. Um, and then the president had to let the Reichstag know if the, this measure was taken. So you would think that this would have been used um, rather sparingly, um, but in fact, it wasn't. Um, and I'll come back to Article 25 in a second. Um, president Ebert actually used Article 48 136 times during his short time as president. Sometimes it was for good reasons, sometimes it was for purely political ones, but as we'll see in a minute, he always returned power to the rest of the government. Um, then the last piece of the Constitution we're going to look at is that the president of the Reich could dissolve the Reichstag only once for the same cause and then call for a new election. So if we go back a couple slides, um, you can see that the Reichstag elections, um, they were supposed to be elected for four years. So in theory, they would have an election every four years. But um, as we'll see, um, by the early 1930s, they were having elections much more frequently than that. And um, one is to assume it was under this Article 25 of the Constitution. Um, so the 20s, I'm going to kind of rush through this slide, but the 20s was uh, very eventful everywhere in the world, obviously. Um, Germany had hyperinflation, that picture that you see there, and you may remember one from elementary school with the wheelbarrow full of cash. Um, Germany ended up having a hyperinflation problem. Their currency became worthless. Um, they, they fell behind on their reparations payments. They, they were supposed to make extreme payments um, as part of the settlement after World War I. And so the political unrest in the country just kept uh, pursuing through the 20s. Um, and then in November of 1923, um, we get the first sort of public appearance of Hitler, which was the Beer Hall Putsch, which was an attempt to take over the government um, by the right wing under Hitler's direction. So uh, Hitler ends up getting tried for his participation in the attempted takeover of the government. He's sentenced to a very short sentence in jail. While in jail, he writes Mein Kampf. Um, and um, then starting in the 20s, the Nazis start picking up seats in the, in the Reichstag. Um, in 1925, Paul von Hindenburg uh, was elected president to replace uh, Frederick Ebert. And um, Hindenburg was a conservative. He had uh, been an uh, important military person before he was elected. He was not a fan of the democracy. He felt that it was an illegal government that had just sort of spun up from no authority. And he used Article 48 many times. Um, he is still president when Hitler is appointed chancellor, so um, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, the late 20s, obviously, the Great Depression, um, it caused it wreaked havoc in the whole country, not just in our, in the whole world, excuse me, not just in our country. Um, and uh, so in the 30s, the Nazis, for the first time, uh, they get a pretty large showing, 107 seats, makes them the second largest party 
in Germany. Um, then in 32, there's another election and the Nazis become the majority party, although their percentage actually went down in the next election just a few months later in November of 30, 32. So then the big day comes, January 30th, 1933. Uh, Hindenburg's president, you still have a Reichstag, you still have a Reichsrat. Um, president Hindenburg appoints Hitler as chancellor. And the reason that he appointed Hitler as chancellor was that the Nazi party was a right-wing party and Hindenburg was a nationalist, which was also a right-wing party. And this was a way for them to form a coalition government and keep the communists and other left-wing parties from taking over. They also felt that if they could, keep, you know, what's that saying, you know, keep your enemies closer than your friends, um, you know, that if they could keep him in the government that he would actually be controllable and wouldn't pose too big of a problem. Yeah, they were obviously wrong about that. Um, this is a video of the night that Hitler was appointed, and that's the Brandenburg Gate. So uh, Hindenburg then agrees, once. Hit, so this is like the day after Hitler becomes chan chancellor, he gets Hindenburg to approve an election. Um, and then three days later, Hindenburg issues this decree called the Decree for the Protection of the German People, which bans political meetings and marches, restricts the press, and gives police expanded powers of arrest. This is all in anticipation of the March 5th election. And um, I, this thing I want to pause on here is the title of the decree. This is a theme that's going to come up a lot, which is it's um, always phrased in the defensive position. So it's not, you know, the decree for restricting political speech. It's a decree to protect the German people from, from the enemy that's out there. And we'll see this come up again. Um, before the election could be held in less than a month after Hitler was appointed as chancellor, the German parliament building, the Reichstag, uh, caught on fire and was burned. And um, I'm going to skip this video because I don't have time and I apologize, but that's a, a, well, actually, I'll play a teeny tiny part of it, maybe. There you see the Reichstag, the German House of Parliament in Berlin, which has been seriously destroyed by fire. <laughs> The main hall in which the deputies conducted their debates has suffered most from the conflagration. And after the general election, which is about to take place, Parliament will have to find a temporary home elsewhere. Flame so you can see there was really extensive damage. So um, the right away after the Reichstag fire, um, the uh, government uh, and Hitler in particular started saying that the fire had been set by Nazis, uh, excuse me, by communists. Um, and in fact, they did arrest several communists. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But they took the opportunity to issue this Article 48, Paragraph 2 decree called the Reichstag Fire Decree, which took away the right to assembly, free speech, free press. It removed restraints on police investigations. Um, the police were essentially allowed to take you into custody if you might prove to commit a crime, not just if you had allegedly committed a crime. Um, and it just increased the powers of the central government. It um, made punishment for crimes more severe, including adding the death sense sentence. And as we saw in the last one, it was framed as a defensive measure against communist acts of violence. Um, the Reichstag fire itself, um, shoot, sorry. The Reichstag fire itself, um, they arrested several communists, as I said, and it depends what decade it is, whether people believe that one or more of these communists set the fire or if the Nazis did it themselves. I, it, my most recent uh, reading of the most recent s literature on this was that it probably was one or two communists, but then I just read something that came out last year that said that there's growing proof that it was not the communists who set the fire. So I don't know if we'll ever know for sure. But in some ways, it doesn't matter whether it was, um, it, whether 
it was set by the communists or the Nazis themselves, it still served as the pretext for this first step in the takeover of the government, which was completed in very short order. Um, they went ahead with the March 5th election. Uh, the Nazis got 44% of the vote. Um, combined with the nationalists, they got 51.9, so a majority of the government. Um, and so that was February 28th. Uh, within a month, March 24th, uh, a statute was enacted called the Enabling Act. Um, the Enabling Act, basically the Reichstag voted itself out of existence. They voted to convey their legislative constitutional power to Hitler as chancellor and to his cabinet. Um, the laws and constitutions under the act could be changed without permission by either the Reichstag or Hindenburg. The laws could deviate from the constitution. All laws became effective the day after they were passed. And the way they got this through the Reichstag is they detained all the communists, 81 of them, and all the social democrats, uh, 20, sorry, 26 of the social democrats. Um, and they did that through this provision that was in the fire decree saying that you could arrest someone who might pose a problem called preventive detention. So you may remember previously under the constitution, you could only amend the constitution if you had a certain percentage of people present and then a certain percentage voted. So there were still enough people there for the Reichstag to vote away its constitutional authority. Um, then, uh, and sorry, there's one more thing I wanna say about that, just notice the name the law to remedy the distress of the people in the Reich. So it continues with that theme that they're out to get us, we have to protect ourselves. Um, a few days later, uh, they adopted all, what they called the law for the imposition of the death penalty. It's sometimes called the Lex van der Lubbe law because that was the name of the lead communist who was tried for the Reichstag fire. And the thing that's notable about this is that it was, um, applied by the German Supreme Court retroactively to the February 28th fire. So in other words, the punishment that was laid out in the March 29th decree went backwards to um, a crime allegedly committed in February. That would actually violate our constitution. We have a law against ex post facto laws, meaning you can't like go back and create a punishment for something that somebody already did. Um, the other notable thing about this is that the Supreme Court um, applied the law to only some of the defendants, not all of the defendants, and this really pissed Hitler off. And it later led to creation of the People's Court, which we'll talk about later, which was a political and terrifying court under the Nazi regime. We're going to skip that one. Um, within the first month, again, you know, Hitler's only been chancellor since the end of January. April 1st, there was a boycott of Jewish businesses in Germany. Um, I'm gonna show you a video of that in a minute. This, to me, this is the most terrifying picture um, because what they did was they stationed photographers outside Jewish owned businesses uh, to intimidate non-Jews from shopping at the businesses owned by the Jews. And this is a cameraman who's there to basically say, look, if you shop at a Jewish shop, we're gonna take your picture and turn you in. And then here's some video of that uh, that boycott.
just occurred to me that my neighbors are going to wonder what's going on in my apartment. Um, okay, so that was April 1st, April 7th. Um, there was a new law adopted that um, you've probably heard of that required um, that uh, civil servants uh, be fired. I'm actually going to just briefly go through this or I'm going to run out of time for other stuff. So basically communists or um, civil servants of quote unquote non-Aryan descents could be fired from their job. A couple things to notice about this. One is that um, people were exempted if they were already employed in their job on August 1st, 1914, or if they fought during World War I. So this was actually typical at the beginning of the Nazi regime that even if you were Jewish, um, if you had fought in World War I, you were exempt from most of, the, um, most of the decrees. That obviously changed much later on. Um, and then the other thing to notice here is that they start trying to define who's a non-Aryan. And what you see in all of these statutes is the sort of mix of religious and racial definition of, sorry, of who is a Jew and who isn't. In this case, they talk about having Jewish parents or grandparents, um, but in other cases, you'll see them talking about belonging to a Jewish community organization. So there's this mixed sense of Jewish as a blood thing or as a race and Jewishness as a, um, as a religion. Um, okay, and that's a copy of a dismissal letter under that statute. Um, the same day they adopted a law uh, barring non-Aryan lawyers from the bar association so they couldn't practice law. Um, but again, what's really kind of interesting about this is that um, they exempted anyone who was admitted before 1914 or who had fought for World War I or the Allies or if your father or son was killed in World War I. And Saul Friedlander, who's you know, one of the eminent um, experts on the Holocaust, um, said that, that because of the exemption, um, about three quarters of the practicing lawyers were actually allowed to continue practicing. Um, and the same thing with judges, um, about half of the judges and prosecutors were able to keep their jobs. So these pictures are from the United States Holocaust Museum. And these are lawyers uh, waiting outside the Bar Association in Berlin, applying to be allowed to continue practicing. Um, and so based on what Saul Friedlander said, most of these people would have been able to keep practicing at this point, despite that statute. Um, the anti-Jewish stuff um, in Germany created a lot of uh, protests in the United States. So there was one in Cleveland, which is where I live. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of this. There was a march in Chicago. And again, this is April of 33. It's silent. And I don't know where this is in Chicago, by the way. I mean, it's clearly downtown, but I don't know where. And again, with apologies, I'm gonna move on just because of time. So, so again, by 33, you had the, you know, uh, basically kicking Jews and communists out of jobs. Um, you had uh, basically Hitler having now all the power of the legislature plus the power of the chancellery, but Paul Hindenburg was still the president. Um, and I, you know, Hitler had this, his, this history of sort of pushing the envelope and knowing just when to stop. And he did not try to take over the authority from the presidency during Hindenburg's life. Instead, he waited for Hindenburg to die. So um, Hindenburg got very ill in uh, 1934 at age 86. 
the day before he died on August 1st, um, the Hiller promulgated with his newly found legislative authority, the law regarding the sovereign head of the German Reich, which basically transferred the president's power to the chancellor upon the president's death. So as soon as Hindenburg, Hindenburg died, um, Hitler now took over the, the role of the presidency as well. So now there's no, there's no Reichstag um, and there's no president. And so Hitler now has got all of the power. Um, interestingly enough, on August 19th, they held a plebiscite to approve Hitler as Fuhrer um, which is a public election, and um, but they very carefully controlled who voted, and um, he was, you know, whatever approved as Führer um, with ninety percent of the vote. Um, right away, so this is August nineteenth. Right, uh, sorry, August second uh, was when Hindenburg died. Right away, um, they changed the oath that lawyers and judges took. Um, when they became lawyers and judges. Um, so this was called coordination and they did this in all kinds of things. They did it in education, they did it in all aspects of German life where everything was coordinated towards the Nazi way of living. And you can see here before this, the oath that a, a lawyer took or a judge was, I swear to the constitution, obedience to the law, and conscientious fulfillment of the duties of my office, so help me God, not too different from what our public figures uh, say when they're sworn into office. Starting August 20th, they said, I swear I will be true and obedient to the Fuhrer of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, observe the law and conscientiously fulfill the duties of my office, so help me God. And this is actually a photo of August 20th, 1934, when all these German judges and lawyers took the oath of office. Um, okay, the Nuremberg Laws. Everyone's heard of the Nuremberg Laws. Um, there were really two of them. I'm going to have to speed through this, and again, I apologize. The first one dealt with citizenship, and the other one dealt with the protection of German blood and honor. The citizenship law basically said if you were a Jew, you were not, um, you were not uh, uh, German. Um, and the second law, the law for the protection of German blood and honor, again, note the way it's phrased, um, basically prevented, pro prohibited sexual intercourse except in marriage between Jews and German nationals. Um, it prohibited Jews from employing female Germans before age 45, um, which sort of promulgates that notion of Jews as sexual predators, that you can't trust a, a Jewish family with a German young woman in their household. They couldn't display the Reich flag, but they could display the Jewish flag, um, and then it had punishments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, both laws gave authority to, for regulations to be drafted under them. So the citizenship law, the first regulation, took a stab at defining who was a Jew, um, which they defined as a Jew as anyone who descended from at least three grandparents who were fully Jewish by race. So there you have the sort of biological definition. But then they also say a Jew is also anyone who descended from two fully Jewish grandparents, so they're half Jewish by race. Um, if they belong to a Jewish community, they are married to a Jewish person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then in the first, uh, the first ordinance from the uh, law prohibiting sexual relations, um, the Article 11 defined extramarital relations. Um, and um, so, so much to cover. Uh, there were, in the meantime, all these other anti-Jewish pieces of legislation in addition to the ones I've specifically uh, talked about. These are, three of them are represented here. You can see the bench that says Nicht für Juden. That's actually a photo from after the war, but the bench still had the inscription on it. Jews couldn't sit on certain benches. They couldn't walk on certain streets. They couldn't um, be in certain parks. Um, of course, on the bottom right, uh, left, you have the Jewish star, which uh, Jews in Germany were required to wear um, starting in the early 40s. And then on the right, you have um, a passport, and you can see it's stamped with a J on it. Jews were required to have their uh, passports stamped with a J. And you can also see that this woman's middle name here is Sarah, and that's because uh, all Jewish women were required to have add the name Sarah as their middle name. 
um, and Jewish men were required to add the name Israel as their middle name. So I actually have had the opportunity to handle and look at a Berlin phone book from the, er, from the uh, late 1930s. And you can tell it was Jewish right away because their middle name is Sarah or Israel. Okay, so now we get to the courts and I'm gonna do this in like three minutes. <laughs> um, so this is what the court structure looked like under the Weimar Republic. For those of you that are lawyers or familiar with the US court structure, this is pretty close to what ours looks like. Um, I'm gonna have to skip over this, but it's important to note that the Nuremberg laws, well, I won't skip it, I'll just do it quickly. The Nuremberg laws actually went before um, the Supreme Court in Leipzig. Um, again, the regular court, not any of the special courts that Hitler and the Nazis created later on. And um, what's striking about this whole thing is that they were called on to um, decide a question of law, which was, um, whether the term sexual relations in the context of Article 11 of the first ordinance for the implementation of the law for protection of German blood and German honor is to be understood as referring only to intercourse, acts similar to intercourse or illicit sexual acts. And what proceeds after that is a judicial opinion that reads just like one of ours. Um, they have a holding, they decide what sexual relations means they have reasoning for it that are um, statutory interpretation standards, even in our courts. You look at the words the drafters chose. If they had meant all sexual relations, uh, they would have used one word. Um, if they meant something else, they would use something else. Um, they look at the words in question in the context of the whole law, and they look at the words in question uh, in light of the purpose of the law. So these are very familiar statutory construction um, theorems or, or ways of interpreting statutes. Uh, the other thing they did was they created these three separate courts. Um, they created the special courts, the people's court, and then something called the hereditary health court. So um, we're gonna talk first about the special courts the special courts were created very, very early in the Nazi regime, March 21, 1933. Um, they were specially set up to adjudicate offenses listed in the Reichstag fire decree, ba decree basically political crimes. Um, and um, this it happens to be a picture of one of the judges from the court named Oswald Rothog. Um, he was the presiding judge in the Katzenberger case. For those of you that have seen the movie Nuremberg with um, Judy Garland, she played Irene Seiler, whose real photo is here. Um, and just very quickly, Irene was, um, th there was uh, Mr. Katzenberger and Irene lived in the same building in Nuremberg. Um, her father had been friends with Mr. Katzenberger and um, he was Jewish, she was not. They were charged with race defilement and they were, um, the, the court was asked to give them uh, death sentences um, under a law called the Folk Pest Law, which basically, among other things, said that if you use the wartime situation to carry out race defilement or other crimes, you could be sentenced to death. Um, so the allegation was that she was having an affair with Mr. Katzenberger, which she and he both denied. They were very affectionate with each other. She said that he was like a second father to her. Um, and they were accused of having sex during, uh, during blackouts at night, which was taking advantage of the war. And so um, they were both, uh, they were both um, the, the prosecutor was trying to get them sentenced to death. Um, so uh, I'm not going to have time for this. Again, though, if you read the court opinion, it reads just like one of our opinions. Is Katzenberger a Jew? Let's look at the evidence. Uh, is Seiler of German blood? Let's look, let's look at her genealogy. Um, what's the evidence that they were having an affair? What's the, uh, you know, the evidence of all of the charges? And then the court goes on to find that they did, in fact, uh, violate the law for the protection of German honor and blood, and that they had also done it taking advantage of the war. And so he was sentenced to death and she was sentenced to several years in prison. 
Um, he, by the way, the trial was only one day and he was killed almost immediately after the trial, which was very common. She survived the war and testified against Judge Rodhug in the Nuremberg trials. And then the last piece about that is that uh, many of you know about Der Sturmer. It was an anti-Jewish uh, rag in Germany. Um, and um, they ran an article about the case. Um, and I'll give you a second to just read that. The People's Court wasn't created until 1934. Again, this is right after Hindenburg died. Um, the People's Court um, was where a lot of um, famous trials were held, including the trial of the members of the White Rose Group and the um, people who participated or allegedly participated in the July 1944 plot to assassinate Hitler. Um, this is a photo of, of Sophie Scholl, whose name I misspelled, I see her, apologies. Um, and um, in a second, this next thing is actual video of uh, the chief judge of the People's Court, whose name was Roland Freisler. Um, this is during the trial of one of the people who participated in the plot to assassinate Hitler. Oops. So, um, by the way, there's a really good German movie called um, Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. They, um, they recreated the People's Court and um, took the script largely from the transcript of the trial. And I actually ask, I make my students watch the 20 minute trial as part of the class. The Final Court, um, which I, you could do a whole thing on this all by itself, um, but uh, Germany, as you know, had a, a process by which they sterilized or murdered um, people with disabilities. And um, they actually set up a court to determine whether people could be sterilized or not. And that was called the Hereditary Health Court. Um, and that was from 1933. Okay, so I think we'll stop and take some questions. Hi, Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate this wonderful lecture and informative, and we already have a ton of questions coming in. Um, we're gonna take questions for about 10 minutes, and then what I thought we would do is, if anyone wants to stay on for a few minutes afterwards, um, we will close the formal program and then um, maybe take a few more questions afterwards. Okay. So let's start with this. So the first question that came up that I think is important comes from one of our fantastic docents. What was the difference between the power of president and chancellor? It seems that we thought that chancellors didn't have much power and it was more of a figurehead, but what actually, it seems like he had some, some real pull in there. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, let me pull up the slide that has the um, constitutional provision. Um, maybe. There we go. 
Um, you know, the I, I guess the chancellor seemed to have had, and so I have to say this is not something I've studied or thought about before, but just looking at the description, the chancellor determined the political program and the presidency, uh, I think, was the one who was responsible for sort of legislation. So I, it's not really clear that there was a big difference between the two. Um, the chancellor was the one who recommended the ministers, the president appointed them, the cabinet. So in some ways, I think the important point is that um, it's, it was sort of a shared power, another check and balance. And of course, um, my friend John Geringer, God bless him, just texted me with something to answer as well. So thank you, John. I got to give credit where credit is due. And he's right. Hindenburg was extremely old at this point. Um, so, you know, having both of them there didn't really mean you had two real figureheads once Hitler became chancellor. Now, when Ebert was president, there was a chancellor then too. And, you know, you don't get that kind of imbalance of strength between an old and weak president and a young and strong chancellor that you do once Hitler's there with Hindenburg. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to piggyback on Hindenburg, was the goal of the nationalists like Hindenburg to do away with the Weimar constitution and perhaps establish a dictatorship as well, just under someone different than Hitler? I don't know if they wanted to establish a dictatorship and, um, you know, I think that they longed, everything I've read suggests that they really longed for the monarchy more than anything else. And so um, they would not necessarily have wanted a dictatorship, but they definitely wanted a firmer hand at the top and more of a right wing than a left wing communist uh, sort of structure. Um, I don't know that there were any good options at that point for that, unless they had been able to get Hindenburg to somehow you know, or one of the military people to somehow become monarch-like. Um. Okay. Um, we have a question. We saw something, one of our, another great docent of ours has a question, and we think we saw a boycott sign that was in English yes. in your presentation. Yes. Could you speak to that a little bit and yes. what, why it was in English? So that event is something I have studied a lot, and I do not know, but they were all in German and English, which suggests to me that the audience, it could mean a number of things, right? It could mean, I've never seen anything explaining why they did it officially, but okay. to me it could mean that they wanted the United States and maybe Britain to take note of what they were doing. The other is, as I said before, Hitler seems to always have been sort of sticking a toe in the water, and if nobody objected, he kept going. And in some ways, this might have been to see what kind of reaction he would get from the English-speaking Jewish world. Um, and if it was just protests and not, you know, attacks on Germans, you know, that maybe it was okay to keep going. I don't really know why they did it, but I can tell you it was extremely prevalent. Every sign I've seen that was that official printed sign was in both German and English. And, so and interesting. it starts with Germans defend yourself. That's the first thing it says in English. Well, thank you for that explanation and great question. Um, why do you think the bench and the bar became so complicit to what was going on? Why was it just so easy? Yeah. So that's a question that my students and I spend an entire period talking about, and there's been a lot of writing about this. Um, I, I don't know that anyone knows for sure, um, but there are definite pieces to it. So one is that, you know, the judiciary, many of whom were still serving from the pre-Weimar Republic days, was pretty conservative. Um, they had been raised in a very conservative uh, judicial system. Um, you know, there's that joke about in Germany, the trains always run on time. There's this real sense of hierarchy in Germany and of rules and of get it, you know, following the rules and the trains are always on time and everything runs like clockwork. And so from that, there might have been this sense that, you know, the rule of law is the rule of law and you obey the rule of law, whatever it is. Um, the judges viewed their role as 
interpreting the law, not creating it. Um, and I don't know that they had um, the ability to declare things unconstitutional like our Supreme Court can or our courts can. Um, the judges took an allegiance to the state rather than this sort of abstract concept of the law. You know, we spend a lot of time in legal education in the United States training lawyers to understand that their first allegiance is to law as a notion um, and as a way to manage a society. Um, and then there's also the sad truth that a lot of lawyers were making money and reputations off of these laws. Like you could have a, you know, you could, you know, split hairs over whether someone was Jewish or not and represent them and try to have them declared not Jewish and therefore not subject to certain things. Um, and then, of course, they eliminated a lot of the critics from the bench, from the bar, from, so that the newer lawyers would have been, who didn't fight in World War I, would have been kicked out of the bar. Um, and then I think the last two that I have on my little list here um, that are probably the most important is really the Reichstag fire decree happened so fast. It happened the day after the fire. The act that took away the Reichstag's power was less than a month later. Um, and I think people kind of feel like if the bench and bar didn't stand up right then, like the, it was lost. That, that was, it was such a fast, slippery slope that if you didn't get in there and do something quick, you had a problem. And then once you get to the people's court, they start appointing lay judges who are Nazi, you know, members of the Nazi, vehement members of the Nazi party, and then all hope is lost. So were, were there any attempts to litigate against the changes or use legal tools that were available? I don't, I don't know if there were attempts to call them illegitimate. Um, I do know that there were attempts to um, apply them in ways that were helpful. So for example, um, I personally read a bio of someone who, I can't remember what it was, but their employer, they were going to get like unemployment compensation if the employer laid them off and so the employer laid them off and then went to court to show that they were entitled to benefits so i i think there was some like playing within the rules to try and get a uh, you know a, a good result for a particular person but i don't know there was a mechanism to challenge the constitutionality of the whole thing okay all right I remember their constitution was only you know it it was not very old um Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to do one more question. And ladies and gentlemen, we will stick around for a little bit right after, sort of like hanging out in the lobby and speaking with the speaker. <laughs> um, so we'll close our for former, our formal program um, after this question. And then um, please do stick around. Um, so my final question is, were there attorneys and or judges that stood up for the communists and Jews at first? And then how many victims of the Holocaust as time went on? It became clear what Hitler and the Nazis were doing. Were there attorneys or judges that stood up for the communists and Jews at first? Yeah, I, I think there were some. I don't think it was really very uh, rampant. Um, and certainly the Bar Association as an organization did not stand up. Um, now, mind you, the Bar Associ Association there was kind of part of the governmental structure, whereas here it's a little bit removed from, it's very removed from the governmental structure. So, um, so you know, occasionally you see stories in some of the histories about particular judges who objected or whatever, but it's, it wasn't common. Okay. Also, wow. Can I just say this? I think it's very hard to imagine on March 20th, 1933, that in 12 years, most of the Jews of Europe will be wiped out, right? I mean, it's just, it's just hard to, when people always ask me, like, why didn't Jews leave? It's like, who would think that a civilized society that produced, among other things, some of the greatest poets and composers of history, would start killing its own citizens. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, in, I'm sh I don't know, you, you'd have to have had a crystal ball to know where it was all going, I think. Unbelievable, unbelievable looking back yeah. with hindsight now. Um, 
Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I want to encourage everyone, if you have a moment, to fill out the survey that I just put in the comment section. If you don't have time now, don't worry. We're going to send you a thank you email with that survey um, attached, and it will make sure that we are on our mark and we can report back to our funders and continue to bring incredible programming to you. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. If you are an attorney and you have not yet set a private chat to Kelly Zaney to collect your CLE credit, please do so now so she knows you are in attendance. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we have great programming coming up um, over the next um, couple months. Our next big one that I want to tell you about, important one that I think would be appealing to um, the people who are here at the program, is on June 10th, we have our commemoration of the 155th anniversary of Juneteenth. This will be an incredible evening with um, attorney Cheryl Lynn Ifill. She is the president and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So please join us as she talks about civil rights, voting, judicial diversity, um, and um, we'll comment on her book, um, her best-selling book um, on the courthouse lawn. So thank you for coming, we appreciate it. And um, we're gonna stick around now and ask some additional uh, questions. I'm going to go turn a couple lights on because it's gotten dark while we've done this. So I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. And Susan, thank you um, so much for your comment. Looks like we sent out the wrong link by accident. Um, it says the role of judges, but it, it came differently. So don't worry about it. We will post it on. Um, we'll put it in the thank you note. So thank you everyone for attending. And um, as soon as she comes back, we will ask some additional questions. Okay, I'm back. That's a little better. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to go back up to our question here. Thank you for everyone for hanging out with us a little bit longer. We're going to stay about 10 more minutes. All right, so we had a comment here. We had so many questions, so many good questions. Goodness, quite a long chat. So, so many. Um, so the question is about Jewish attorneys and judges um, that had not been allowed to initially stay in the bar to practice. Is the presumption that more attorneys and Jews in general would have tried to leave Germany in the early 1930s? If they had been kicked out of their profession? I assume yes. that's what they're asking. Yes. Oh, who knows? I mean, you know, again, up until Kristallnacht, which I haven't talked about at all tonight, but which the museum has a wonderful display about, um, I don't think people really knew that they would be in danger. You know, it was, it wasn't until that night of extreme violence that, people thought they would be in such danger. And of course, by then you couldn't get a visa to go anywhere um, and you couldn't get exit papers. You certainly couldn't come to the United States. Some people managed to get to Shanghai. I mean, but by the time I think it became apparent that this wasn't just economic isolation, but was also physically risky, um, you couldn't really go anywhere. So you would have had to go between 33 and 38 to get out. Yes, okay. Pierre, I see you there with a raised hand. If you wouldn't mind putting your question in the chat and we will try to get to it, okay? Put that in the chat. Thank you. All right, so we had a question here. Could you comment on positivism? Positivism. On the, pos the concept yeah. used by judges to rationalize rulings in the support of Nazis. Uh, yeah, um, so... The idea is that judges, um, and I'm actually trying to remember which is paleological and which is positivism, but um, I think there was this sense that the structure of Germany up until then was really um, sort of the, the way things should be structured and that the authority figures deserve respect as authority figures and therefore it's a judge's job to apply 
whatever law the authorities see fit. So like in the United States, we're trained more to question everything, even non-legal education. But in legal education, it's not uncommon when you're teaching a law school class to have a student argue one side of a case and then turn to the same student and say, what's the other side, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the, I don't think there was this sense that of the ability to contest authority and law the way we have in our society. Understood, understood. And how much did the Nazis borrow from American laws in regards to race? Well, sadly, quite a bit. Um, not necessarily uh, Judaism, but especially when it came to people with disabilities. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, you know, there was a science called eugenics, which was actually started in the United States, which served as the basis for um, what the Nazis first did to people with disabilities and then ultimately to Jews because in their screwed up thinking, it was that Judaism is a race. It's a blood related racial thing. It's an inferior race. And so we combine eugenics, which is breeding for the optimal humans and, and breeding out undesirables, which includes Jews, um, to get the perfect society. So it really served as the first step, which the Nazis then took 10 steps more. Um, what I was going to say is wonderful is not the eugenics policy, but there was a really good American experience series on eugenics and its foundation in the United States. So for anyone who has access to that, I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you so much. To what extent, if any, were German jurists suspended or tried following the war? And how long, yeah, we'll, we'll do that one first. And then the second part of it is how long did it take for post-war Germany to reject uh, the 1933 laws and the things that were happening in subsequent laws afterwards. After World War II, it, yeah. After yeah. World War II was over. Post war, yeah. Um, okay. So um, I know that, again, John Geringer did a lecture about the Nuremberg trials a couple weeks ago as part of this series. Um, so the answer is that after the war, there were um, several trials at Nuremberg. One of them was the major war criminals trial, and another one was a jurist trial. So there was, of the, of the Nuremberg trials, one dealt with industrialists, one dealt with the medical experiments, one dealt with the Eisensgruppen, and one dealt with the jurists. And um, one of the defendants, as I said earlier, was Judge Rudhug, who had been the person that presided over the Katzenberger case. Um, and so that trial was um, very much focused on the bench during uh, during World War II and during the Holocaust. And what's really interesting for me about that, um, or has been helpful to me, is they translated a lot of the Nazi legislation, and that is where I have gotten a lot of the legislation that I've read, is from the exhibits to those trials. Then, after that, um, there were trials in, I mean, if you think about just Berlin, Berlin was cut up into four different, you know, political areas. Um, you had the Soviet Union with East Germany and Europe and U.S. and other countries in West Germany. Um, and so you had all these domestic trials. Um, but then they also realized you can't just fire everybody, right? Um, and so they had something called a denazification program after the war where uh, judges and jurists um, and lawyers and others were denazified and then retrained and sent back into their profession. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, sorry, can I just say one more thing about that? Absolutely. You know, for people who haven't, haven't been to Germany today, one of the things that struck me, the first time I went to Germany, I know you can't tell with my name, but I'm Jewish. And one of the things that struck me the first time I went to Germany, which I was very nervous about, was how well, at least in Berlin, which is where I've spent my time, how well they've grappled with their past. There are memorials everywhere. People know all about the history. It's taught in the schools. It's, it's just a part of, I, I feel like they've reckoned with their past very well. So when did that transition take place between 1945 and now? It was probably very slow. But if you go there now, you get this sense that of um, societal, Responsi sense of responsibility and, and mourning for what happened. 
Thank you. Uh, looking at the time, we'll take two more questions, uh, Kathy, and to our viewers tonight. So thank you everyone for your patience and sticking around. We're gonna do two more. With this history in mind, are there specific things you think legal practitioners in the U.S. should currently be looking for or doing? How should lawyers be wielding power? Ooh, that's the $65 million question, isn't it? Um, I think the answer is complicated. Um, you know, I, I mean, we all have to not stay quiet. Um, we have to insist upon decorum from our bench. Um, we have to um, remember that everyone's entitled to representation in this country and to a fair trial. And um, there, you know, we have to make sure that the populace understands what lawyers do and what judges do. Um, it's too simple to say, just follow your conscience because um, the example I always give my students is, you know, once the Supreme Court of the United States said that gay marriage was legal, um, the registrar in, I think it was Alabama or Mississippi, who wouldn't issue marriage license licenses uh, to gay couples was following her conscience. Um, and so that's not always the answer either. And so it's a very difficult, difficult question um, of what we can do. But just sort of keeping an eye out for these things and also making sure that our elected representatives don't cede their power. And to me right now, that is something that I worry about that um, the US Senate in particular, but that other branches of government are ceding their power too much. And you can see what happened in Germany once the, the legislature ceded its power to Hitler, it was a very easy walk to a dictatorship. Um, we're a long way from there. I'm not saying we're anywhere near there, but you know, you have to be aware of these things. Well, our tagline is remember the past and transform the future. And that's why we're all here tonight. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. It is 745, but thank you for coming. Thank you for giving us your time. And Kathy, just a huge bit of gratitude to you for being here with us tonight and um, it's really my pleasure thank you for having me and um we will see everyone soon look out for a thank you email from all of us with upcoming programs and the survey all right thank you guys we'll see you again soon have a good night take care bye